morning. All right, Matthew chapter 3, as Susan just reminded us, we're going to be in the last few verses here, verse 13 through 17 in Matthew chapter 3. So turn there with me, we'll jump in in just a minute, but last week we had the privilege of having some of our uh, missionaries with us, and also a couple missionaries that were new to us, uh, and new to our church, we introduced them last week, and then we also have the privilege of having another uh, missionary couple with us today. Uh, Doug and Denise Gregson are here. Uh, Doug and Denise have been supported by this church for a long time, uh, and they uh, work on creating electronic devices that can take the gospel to closed peoples and closed countries uh, and spread the gospel that way. So I would encourage you, uh, as Doug and Denise are here today, they will be out in the foyer. Um, feel free to stop and say hi to them. Please do that in front of our missionary wall. Uh, that's the place where you can run to them. If you haven't met them before, we would love for you to get to know them uh, a little bit while they're here uh, for the weekend. Matthew chapter 3. Uh, let's jump in. We are in a unique section here in Matthew chapter 3 uh, as Jesus comes back onto the scene. So last week we had this uh, walk through where John the Baptist was the second part of John the Baptist's message here at the beginning of chapter 3, where he specifically focuses in on this idea of repenting. And what it means to repent and why you repent, because the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. And John was the one who went before to announce the coming Messiah so that when the Messiah came on the scenes, people wouldn't miss him. So that was John's main objective here as he got into the first part of chapter three here. And at the end of chapter three, we see Jesus coming back onto the scene. The last we, we heard about Jesus in this particular book, in Matthew chapter 2, uh, Jesus was about two years old. He was a child. He was setting, settling into his home in Nazareth. And now we see some, probably about 30 years later, for about 30 years, Jesus has grown, learned, served in relative obscurity uh, in Galilee, which, which is not the, the, the main kind of focal area of Israel. It's more of kind of a backwater, uh, not well-known country environment. And that's where he has spent the, the majority of his life now until he is roughly 30 years of age. As Je Jesus walks back into the scene here, he walks in to John the Baptist, doing what John the Baptist has been doing, right? John the Baptist baptizes people. So he's been doing this in the wilderness. He's been walking around proclaiming repentance, proclaiming the kingdom of heaven, telling people to prepare themselves because the Messiah is here. And now, as John's doing this one day, we pick up in, in verse 13 of chapter 3. So read with me, verse 13 through 17, and then we'll go back and pull apart some some things the Lord has for us this morning. Verse 13 of chapter 3 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. May God give us some insight into his word this morning, and as we kind of dig in here a little bit, we see this, this honestly, in and I, I know, I probably say this more often than I should, but this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, okay? Um, but because the baptism of Jesus here gives us something that is so critical for us to understand as followers of Christ. That if we are going to identify with Jesus, and particularly identify with him in one of the ways that we believe God has laid out for us through baptism, that there are some unbelievably unique things happening here in this passage of Scripture. As Jesus goes down into the water with John and gets baptized himself. This is one of these situations, and it happens a few times throughout the Gospels and even into the book of Acts a little bit, but when Jesus is interacting with his followers and he does something that kind of turns everything on its head, right? 
John the Baptist, right? John, John's standing in the water. He is baptizing people. Uh, he's kind of a little bit of a, you know, kind of main attraction out here in the middle of the desert. He dresses funny. He eats funny stuff. He talks differently than anybody who's gone before him. And he is kind of this last Old Testament prophet. If you remember, we've talked about that. And as he's proclaiming repentance, now the Messiah, who he is telling everybody to get ready for, comes down into the water to get baptized. And you, and you can kind of place yourself in the scene there, right? John's baptizing somebody and baptizes the next person. He kind of moves them on. He's declaring repentance. He's moving them on. He turns around. There's Jesus. And John's like, whoa. No, you do me, right? Let's go that way. You should baptize me. And Jesus says, no. We're going to do this for the reason that we have been seeing even in the first two and a half chapters of the book of Matthew, to fulfill all that had been declared beforehand. See, Jesus walks into this environment where John says, you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. And Jesus says, no, we're going to do this to fulfill all righteousness. We're going to do this the way that God wants me to go through this. Why? Because, and this is one of the main things we need to hold on to, Jesus is our ultimate example in all things. He is our ultimate example in all things. He is our perfect example in all things. He is the one who goes before us in all things. He's also the one who goes with us in all things. As Jesus goes down into the water here and walks up to John the Baptist, John the Baptist is thinking, I, I got to think, and I, it doesn't say exactly what he's thinking, but I'm thinking he's like, oh, he's here. He's going to baptize me. And then he's going to probably preach the best sermon we've ever heard. And John's ready for it. He's been declaring the Messiah is here. He's been declaring that everything is going to change. He's been declaring that the kingdom of heaven is now with us because Jesus has come to the earth. And Jesus says... Verse 15, let it be so now, for thus it is fulfilling for us to fulfill all righteousness. This is another very stark reminder that Jesus is the fulfillment of all righteousness. He says it, he walks it out, and he leaves it for us as an example. We can't do what Jesus has done for us. We, we cannot be the fulfillment of righteousness without him standing in our place. And he says it right here to John. He says, yeah, I know. I, I, you know. He probably could walk away and just tell people to keep getting baptized. And he could begin baptizing people. Just as John already said, he says, the one is coming behind me. I can't even hold his sandals there's one coming so much mightier than me. I'm baptizing with water. The Messiah is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. One being an external example of something and one being an indwelling, eternal example of something. And as Jesus is standing here in the water, this is the beginning of his public ministry. He doesn't start with a coliseum full of people that he gets to speak through. He doesn't start with some incredibly miraculous act that everybody gasps and steps back from. What does he start with? He starts with baptism. He starts with baptism. He walks down in the water and John's been declaring repentance. And Jesus, while he has no need to repent and has no need to be cleansed from anything... He steps into those waters so that what happens right after this can be seen by everybody. Baptism is something that we take very seriously. It's something that we suggest as a church family for anyone who has placed their faith in Jesus. Anyone who says, yes, I'm a disciple of Christ. Because to be a disciple means to follow your teacher. And to be a disciple of Jesus means we, we follow him. And 
He even went down into the waters to give us a perfect example of baptism. So you may ask, why do we baptize? You know, we've got a baptismal back here. Why, why the water? Why going down in the water and coming out? Doesn't that seem a little strange sometimes? No, it doesn't. Here's why. Because baptism is the picture of what Jesus does for us spiritually. When, when we go towards baptism, we are identifying with Jesus. And that's one of the things that we're going to spend the majority of our time on this morning. The baptism, baptism is an identity statement. That's what baptism is. It is an identity statement. We identify with Christ, not only the fact that he got baptized, but also, as we know, later in the story of God, as Jesus goes to the cross, he dies, he goes into the grave, he does not stay there, he victoriously is resurrected from the grave. And our baptism, which not exactly like that, is a symbol of identifying with him here and identifying with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. That we as Followers of Jesus declare, I am with Jesus. I'm willing to follow him. I'm willing to do everything he asks me to do. I'm willing to do what he has done before me. Because he has done everything for me. So as we identify with baptism in today's day and age, and we go down into the water, symbolizing when Jesus went down into the grave, and we come back out of the water, symbolizing that he has resurrected us spiritually into new life. We are identifying with him. We're not just identifying with the gathering place at NSBC. We're not just identifying with the people that are in the room that have already been baptized and, and we go along with them. We're not only identifying with those earthly, tangible things. We are identifying with him. And that's the most important thing that we see happening here. When Jesus goes down into the water here, there is an unbelievable interaction that happens. This is the clearest place in God's word that I think we see all three persons of the Trinity interacting right in front of us, recorded for us. The Son is in the water, the Spirit descends onto him, and the Father speaks from heaven. There's nothing clearer than that. I've heard lots of conversations and even, even debates and maybe even arguments about the Trinity. And while the word Trinity is not in Scripture, the concept of the Trinity is all through Scripture. And here's one of the clearest examples. Father, Son, and Spirit uniquely interacting with each other in this moment this isn't just four verses for us to move on and get into what Jesus starts doing on this earth. These are four verses that set the table for everything he's going to do, and in doing so, set the table for everything we are called to do. It's an identity statement. Because if you don't work out of a right understanding of your identity, you will always be trying to catch up. You'll always be striving. You'll always be trying to earn God's favor. You'll always be trying to be good enough for others to think something of you. You'll always be striving if you don't understand what happens here and in doing so, what happens to you and I as we place our faith in him. Jesus' baptized, baptism takes on an identifying feature that God wants us to see very clearly. And here it is. In verse 16, when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went up from the water. Why, why do we do a full immersion baptism? Which, and, and here's the thing. We believe in full immersion baptism. Why? Because I think that's what we see right here, clearly enough. So that's why we do it that way. Does that mean that in other instances, when that's not possible, or is it, does that mean it's not right? No, no. What we're saying is here, we're going to stay as close to Scripture as possible. So when we baptize someone, they go down in the water like Jesus did, and they come up out of the water like Jesus did. 
because he's our perfect example. It says, when he went up from the water, behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. The Holy Spirit descends from heaven. The sky opens and the Holy Spirit descends onto Jesus. It says like a dove. And I know you've probably all seen paintings and we've seen pictures. It wasn't actually a dove. Okay, it's not, the Holy Spirit didn't turn into a bird and come down and land on his shoulder. Okay, but the reality is this. A dove is an example of a peaceful animal, a peaceful bird. Also, doves were known in ancient times for being perfect. They were completely white. So the symbolism here that Matthew records for us, it was the Holy Spirit comes like a dove. Peacefully, perfectly, and descends onto Jesus. So we've got the Son in the water doing exactly what he's been asked to do and fulfilling all righteousness. That's our setting. We have the Spirit of God descending from heaven onto him. And then thirdly, verse 17. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Apart from the fact that we're going to pull this, this direct statement apart in some different ways in a minute, but this is one of the places I go to Scripture when people ask me, was Jesus really the son of God? Well, yep. Will you read this with me? We read a verse together. I said, what do you think that says? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus wasn't just another prophet in the line of John the Baptist. He wasn't just another rabbi and great teacher that exceeded other people. He wasn't just someone who the Lord used to do miraculous things like some of the prophets he had used in the Old Testament time. He's more than those things. Does he do all those things? He does. But who is Jesus? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. An identifying statement clear as any you're ever going to come across. The father wants everyone there and everyone coming after when this gets recorded to know exactly who Jesus is. This statement gives us some very stark realities. It tells us that Jesus belongs to the Father's family. He says, this is my beloved son, part of his family. It says that he is beloved. When God looks down on Jesus standing in that water, he says, not only is this my son, but I love him. It also tells us that Jesus is not partially pleasing to the Father. He is fully pleasing to the Father. Completely. The phrase here we see in verse 17 says, with whom I am well pleased. But the word well there is, is interesting. It can be translated out of the original in a couple different ways. But one way that it's also some, sometimes translated is full. Full. Complete. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am fully pleased. There's nothing left that has to be done for Jesus to have the favor of the Father. No, he is fully pleased with him already. And Jesus hasn't gone out into all the days of ministry. We know from here, he calls disciples, he teaches in parables, he does miracles, he feeds thousands upon thousands of people from almost nothing. He raises Lazarus from the dead, he walks on water, he casts out demons, he does all this stuff that come in the next few pages here. But the Father is completely pleased with him before he does any of that. It wasn't those actions 
that the father looked down on and said, now I'm pleased with my son. Look what he's doing. No, the father is completely, fully pleased in Christ simply because of who Jesus is, not because of what he does. Because of who he is. This identity statement is one that we as followers of Christ, we need to spend some time reminding ourselves of and asking ourselves, do we believe this about ourselves? Scripture is clear in other places that once you have placed your faith in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come, we are in him. When the Father looks on us, if we are placed our faith, if we have placed our faith in him and we are in Christ, he no longer sees our blemishes. He no longer sees our sin, our wrongdoings. He doesn't see our shortcomings. He sees Jesus in front of us. So, what is this identity statement? What is this act of fulfilling righteousness in baptism and this identity statement that happens with the Holy Spirit descending on him and the Father declaring that he is a loved son and that he is fully pleased in Christ? What does that mean for us? How should this affect us? This is, yeah, this is a narrative little passage of Scripture that Matthew is simply telling us something that happened. But in knowing this happened, we as disciples of Jesus need to understand how it affects us. With all three persons of the Trinity being present in this moment and active in this particular moment, this brings to us a very clear identity of who we are called to be together as followers of Jesus. Let's take a few minutes and look at three things that I believe we need to understand about this identity and who we are. First, the Father is present here. The Father identifies Jesus as his son, announces that he is well, fully pleased with him. Because the Father is fully pleased with Jesus, his payment later and his covering of us also has the complete authority to place us in the family of God with him. When God looks down on those who have been made new in Christ, he looks and says, this is my son, this is my daughter, and I am fully pleased and love them. This is something we struggle with, folks, all the time. Not only do you not have to earn God's favor, you can't earn God's favor. God's favor, his love, this statement that he makes with Jesus in this moment, he also makes towards all those who are in him and says, you are beloved and I am pleased if you are in Christ. Jesus didn't get all the miracles done and then God the Father says this. He didn't go out and do all the stuff that we know him to have done later following all that the Father had asked him to do and, and setting aside his own will and doing the will of the Father. It's not then that the Father is pleased. It's now, before any of that happens. What does this mean for us? This means that we need to understand that the Father brings us into a family when we trust Christ. It's not just a transactional piece where, okay, I believe in Jesus, I'm not gonna go to hell, I get to go to heaven. It is that, no doubt about that. Jesus clearly defeated sin, Satan, and death so that we could spend eternity with him. But it's also so that we can be part of his family now. Because being part of God's family carries with it this distinct advantage and pleasure. That the Father looks down and says, you're beloved. 
I'm pleased. The Father declares that Jesus is the perfect completion of all that he has asked for. And because Jesus is the one that fully pleases the Father, we who follow behind him can rest in the fact that God is fully pleased in Christ and therefore fully pleased with those who are in Christ. Is that, is that good for you? Is that good news? I talk to so many people all the time who are trying to earn God's favor every day. When they messed up, they're guilty to themselves, they're shamed because they didn't do it perfectly for God. When they do well, they think God looks on them with brighter eyes and more pleasure. And that is not true, folks. There's only one thing that fully pleases the Father, and that's the Son. And the fact that we, because of the Son's payment for us and for our sin and resurrection and victory, the fact that we can be in him, in Christ, means the Father looks down and says, you don't need to do anything else for me to love you. You don't need to do anything else for me to be fully pleased. You don't have to get better. You don't have to work harder. You don't have to check more boxes. God looks down at Jesus and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And if you are in Christ today, he says the same to you. He says the same to you. This is my son or my daughter, my beloved son or daughter with whom I am well pleased. Is there anything better than the creator of the universe, the God of all things, the sovereign in all of the universe looking down and saying, I love you, and I'm pleased with you. What do we see here from the Son in this interaction of the Trinity? We see Jesus not only entering into the water when he didn't need repentance from sin, but he wanted us to know what it looked like to fulfill all righteousness and follow the, the Father. We see Jesus serving he serves all those that are present. How? He serves all those that are present and all those to come by fulfilling what the Father had asked him to do. That is part of the Messiah's serving to us, is he has done what the Father required. While Jesus did not have need for his sin to be washed away or him to be cleansed internally, he humbly identifies with the sinful people he came to save. Jesus says many times, going forward, and we'll touch on some of these as we go throughout the rest of the Gospel of Luke, he says more than once, I have come not to be served, but to serve. Jesus, a member of the Trinity, the Son of the Heavenly Father, the Savior of the world, the only perfect one to live a sinless life in this earth. And he says, I did not come to be served by others. I have come to serve. What does that look like? That looks like this exact situation. Jesus walking down into the water with John the Baptist. How is he serving us in this? He's serving us by showing us what we need to do how we need to follow. And setting the table for us to have an identity statement that changes us, and therefore, because it changes our identity, it changes everything we do. He models what he later teaches his disciples. He's later when he washes the disciples' feet in the upper room before he goes to the cross. He takes the lowest role in that room and washes their feet. Why? Because he wants them to see this is what it means to follow me, to serve. 
to go to any extent so that others will know that the Father wants to declare them beloved and be fully pleased in them. Any extent. The Holy Spirit we see in this interaction as well. Scripture says, when he saw the Spirit of God after the skies had opened, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. The Holy Spirit being sent onto the Son signifies for us Jesus' empowerment to fulfill all that was prophesied and all that we know he will do as we go forward in the story. The full mission that the Father had sent him to complete, the mission of redeeming sinners from their sin, saving those he had created. The Holy Spirit anoints Jesus here, comes on him as Israel's King and Messiah, and commissions Jesus as the Father's righteous and perfect servant. Many years before, in Isaiah chapter 42, this is prophesied of the coming Messiah. It says this in Isaiah 42, verse 1. And that day you will behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to all the nations. Jesus fulfills that here. As the Spirit descends onto him, as Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 42, the Spirit will descend onto him and he will fulfill all that he has been called to do. We're going to get in in the next couple of weeks as we get into chapter 4, how the Spirit of God guides, leads, directs, empowers, and upholds Jesus. In the next couple of chapters, it becomes so abundantly clear that this anointing, this empowerment from the Holy Spirit was pivotal to Christ, who was at this point fully God and fully man, carrying out the purposes of the Father. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself and get into that, but I want us to see here and know clearly that Father, Son, and Spirit are active and present in this moment, and they bring to Jesus and to all those who are listening a specific identity statement. Part of his family that we're called to serve and lead others to serve. And that just like the Holy Spirit is sent unto Christ and then right after this moment, Christ goes out into the wilderness and then comes back into public ministry, the Holy Spirit is sent to him and sends him on mission. This is why I, I, I believe one of the clearest statements for who we are as the people of God is this. We are a family of servant missionaries. That's who the people of God are. Why? Because we're supposed to be like him. This is what Jesus is showing us right in this chapter. He is part of the family, beloved son, fully pleasing to the father. He serves all those who are present and all those who will follow his example by doing all that God has asked him to do and eventually serving us through the cross and the resurrection perfectly. And he is sent. The word missionary, and we've talked about this before as a church family, the word missionary just means sent one. And we do celebrate. We did last week. We mentioned another missionary couple that's with us today that are serving in different parts of the world, doing different things that God's called them to. But we need to understand this. If you are in Christ, if you are following Jesus, as a beloved son or daughter, fully pleasing to the Father because of Jesus, you are a missionary. You're a missionary. The Holy Spirit is sent to you at the point of your salvation, and the Holy Spirit sends you on mission. That's the definition of a missionary. A sent one. We are sent into every relationship, every environment, every conversation, every workplace, that God has given us to serve him and bring the gospel to. Every believer is a missionary. Now, some missionaries do go away and do other things in other parts of the world, and some missionaries stay right here and do exactly what God's called them to do right here. 
But we are all missionaries if we are in Christ. And we are all vocational missionaries. It is your job. God just routes your paycheck through different sources. We are all taken care of by the Lord and supported to do exactly what he has called us to do. Why? Because when we follow Jesus, we are identifying with him. And it's clear from this instance and everything going forward, Jesus understood who he was, whose family he was a part of, and what his mission was. So do we, as a family of servant missionaries, understand that this baptism with John the Baptist in the river, the Jordan River, that one day, that the interaction that happens here and, and the event that's recorded for us is an identity statement for everyone who places their faith in Christ and follows him. Every human being is searching to be part of the family of God. God has created us to want to be with him. We spend too much time trying to fill that void, that need in our heart with so many other things. God wants us to look at this situation, this event, and understand if you are in Christ, he looks at you, and no matter what you messed up recently, no matter what you didn't measure up to, no matter what you think you need to do better in life, those things do not define how the Father sees you because of the Son. He looks at you and says, you're beloved, and I'm well pleased. Really, that should change everything for us. Too often we try to make sure that other people think we're beloved. That other people are pleased with us. That organizations approve us. That, that the people around us will pat us on the back and say, you're doing a great job. And I'm not saying those are bad things. But they are not the key thing. The key thing is that the Father in heaven looks on everyone who is in Christ and says, I love you and I'm pleased. And then all that you do is working out of the identity that he has secured for you. You're not working towards that identity. You're not trying to get to that identity. You're not trying to do things for God so that God will look and say, I love you and I'm pleased with you. That's not the case. Because that is an endless pursuit that leads to depression and shame and moments of joy. That's not what we're doing. We're not trying to earn God's favor. We're living out of God's favor. That God loves you and is pleased with you. And then you go and do all the things he's called you to do because he loves you and he's pleased with you. One of the most forgotten or, I believe, neglected things in the Christian life is remembering who you are in Christ. It changes everything to know confidently how God in heaven views you. So before we close today, and we're going to take some time to, to sing and to respond to the good news of Jesus through giving and and praying and celebrating together like we do every week. Before we do that, I want us to pause for a minute and really ask ourselves a hard question. Do you see yourself the way the Father in heaven sees you? Do you see yourself that way? This moment for Jesus empowered him through the Holy Spirit, and sent him to do all the miraculous works that we know. But before that happened, the Father said, this is who you are. Do you know who you are in him? Do you know that because of Jesus, not because of yourself or because of anything you can do, but because of Jesus, 
the Father looks down on you with pleasure, loves you. If we do know this, we can then go and live rightly out of the identity that he has freely given us. It also changes how we view each other, right? When someone else in the family of God does something that bothers you or does something you don't like or, or even maybe intentionally or unintentionally hurts you, how do you view them? See, if we know how we are to view ourselves in Christ, we also know how to view others who are in Christ. See, it changes the situation when somebody wrongs you and you have to look back at them and say, they are a beloved son or daughter of the Father with whom he's well pleased. That changes how I respond. It changes how I should respond. I'll say it that way. If we know who we are in Christ and we know who the other family members are in Christ, it really shapes everything for us in life. Shapes how you go to work. Shapes how you handle your neighbors. Shapes how you respond when you mess up. Because we can mess up and we can repent and we can freely receive the grace of God. Why? Because messing up doesn't lose your favor. Because your favor is secured in Christ. So you get to come back to the Father, not in fear and trepidation, but because you want to be in the presence of his warm, welcoming embrace again. It really changes everything if we know who we are. So this baptism of Christ and the practice of baptism that we come together as a church family and like to celebrate together and that we're called to follow him in, it's not just getting wet and coming out. It's identifying with this very statement and knowing that because of Christ, you can be welcomed into the family of God as a servant of God and be sent with the Spirit of God on the mission of God. So that's the Lord to help remind us of that as we go. And before we do that, I'm going to do something we don't do very often. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me something. Ready? All right, you're warned. Now you're ready. Okay, wake up. Elbow the person next to you, make sure they're here. Okay? Here we go. Okay? Two statements. I will say them, and you repeat them after me. I am loved. loved. He He is pleased. Let's do it again. I am loved. He is pleased. Let that guide and direct us as we go forward. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you are a God who has done everything that we need. And because of Jesus, we do not have to strive for your favor. Lord, I pray that this morning as we sit here, some may feel overwhelmed with their desire to be a better disciple of Jesus. Some may feel like They'll never measure up. And Lord, I pray that through the work of the Holy Spirit, you would say directly to them, they are loved and you are pleased because of Christ. Help us, Lord, to be able to take knowing who we are and knowing who you've called us to be as a family of servant missionaries and change our world. Change our world and help as many people hear the good news of Jesus as we possibly can in every day, and in every way that you allow us to. Lord, I pray that you would settle our hearts this morning, knowing that because of Jesus, we can rest in your family, under your love, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to go as missionaries. Help us to do this well, Lord. We need your help. We need your help when we don't do it well. We need your help to repent. We need your help to understand grace and forgiveness. And we need your help to remember who we are when the world and the devil 
want to convince us that we are not what we should be. Instead, Lord, I pray that your voice is louder than all the others and that we will know we're loved and that you're pleased. It's in your name we pray. Amen.